right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and let the room populate for just a little bit before we get started today. But it looks like everyone is on time as usual, which is appreciated. As we do that, I'm going to go ahead. Okay. So today you are here for our March 2024 webinar for C2C Care, Video Killed the Radio Star, Making Effective Collections Care Videos. Um, we're going to be running from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern today, um, so we will be closing promptly at 2. Also, just as a reminder, um, we are recording today's program, so if you have to leave early, no worries. We'll be posting it on the FAIC AIC YouTube channel just a few days after the live event. Um, and we will be posting all sorts of fun information along the way. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'll welcome everyone. My name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I am the C2C Care Coordinator for FAIC. Um, that is my email address below the window. So if you have any questions about the program, please do send it to that email address. And I am located just outside Washington, D.C. in Silver Spring, Maryland, where the temperature has been rather frantic <laughs> the past couple of days. We were in 70s in the weekends, Fahrenheit, and it was freezing yesterday, so it was a good time. So I do encourage you to share uh, your location in the chat if you feel comfortable doing so. For those of you who are new to our program, uh, welcome. We, this is our home on the web, connecting to collections.org. On that website, you will see all sorts of fun past webinars that C2C Care has done. C2C Care has been around for over 10 years, so there's quite the library of webinars on that program. We also have our archive of courses, which are a little bit more in-depth look at topics, links to our online community, that if you have any questions related to collections care, um, I encourage you to go check out that community. We have a fabulous group of volunteers who will take a look at your question, get you some expert advice and get back to you very quickly. So I encourage you to look at that. You can also link to our resources, um, and there's just a lot of other fun information. So I encourage you to go check out our website if you have not already. We also have two places on social media where you can find information on our programs. Uh, one is Facebook, and then the other is on the network formerly known as Twitter. And you can see both of those handles at C2C Care. So if you go to those, you'll see course announcements, webinar announcements, all sorts of fun information. So I encourage you to go follow those as well. Couple of quick technical notes before we start. Um, as a participant, you're able to access the chat box, which is there to, again, show us maybe where you're located, which it looks like people are doing quite handily. Also ask technical questions or just have general comments. Um, we also have a Q&A box enabled, which is going to be a question for our speaker. If you have questions at any point during the webinar, put it in that box and we'll get through as many as we possibly can. I always like using that Q&A box for its function just because sometimes information can get lost in the chat. So please do that if you can. As I noted, we also are recording today's program. So keep an eye on for that recording a uh, few days after the event. And we have also enabled closed captioning. So if you need that service, just hit the CC button and you'll be able to see a live captioning service going on as we talk. I will also add that all of our C2C Care webinars that go up on YouTube have English captioning and a lot of them have Spanish captioning as well. So please go look at that if you have a chance because it's gonna be quite fun to access the webinars that way. Couple of notes on upcoming programming since I have kind of a captive audience there here right now. On April 25th, we're gonna be doing a webinar on OSHA on-site consultation program. This is a great program that's offered free by OSHA, which I, kind of enables you to find out hazards or issues around your facility. So I encourage you to sign up for that one. We've also lined up our first webinar for uh, AIC's annual May Day program. It's called Regional Emergency Networks, Vacaderns Response to Vermont's Severe Weather and Flooding. Um, it's going to be featuring how this community kind of held together and came and responded to some severe weather and flooding that happened. That's going to be happening on May 1st from 1 to 2 p.m. And then we have one definitely scheduled for June, June 4th, which is Practical Strategies for Care in Film and Glass Negatives. Um, so I would encourage you to sign up for that one as well. If you go to our website, you will see all those webinars ready and open for registration. C2C Care does promote I actually provide one free webinar a month, so keep an eye on our website for future information on those as well. We introduce our speaker for today. Her name is Becca Kennedy. She is the Collections Care Specialist and owner of Cure Collections Care. She's going to be talking to us today about a really good subject related to uh, Collections Care, which is all about all these fabulous videos and things we've been seeing online recently dealing with 
kind of how to deal with advocacy and collections care issues. There's a lot of new features out there and a lot of new things. So and Becca's going to be here to walk us through some new programs and how you might go about designing them. So Becca, feel free to take over whenever you're ready and we will see you during the Q&A. All right, thanks Robin for that introduction. Um, so I'm gonna start by, you know, simply sharing a screen. Step one always with presentations such as this. Um, so for many of those who know me or met me before, I am just a regular registrar collections manager with no IT, no video making experience. But what I have done throughout my career is use digital content to really emphasize training modules to make it more interactive and have really invested time in creating content that people like and it appeals to them all related around collections care. So uh, when I was reached out by C2C Care to talk about this topic, I felt very like, wait, I don't know anything about technology, but I, but I know how to appeal to people based on learning styles and things like that. So I'm going to give you some examples but also because I'm not IT based, I'm not gonna fill your heads with a bunch of IT and video making jargon. It's gonna be very simplistic. Um, also, you can thank Robin for the title, which is why the entire uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation will be very 80s themed. So here we go. So to start this out, I said that this was a PowerPoint, but I actually made this presentation on Canva, which is one of the softwares I'm going to talk to you about today. You might have more experience with others, but I'm going to show you some tricks that really helped me create a lot of content very quickly. But the first thing we have to talk about is how do we learn? Uh, what is the best way to actually get a message across to whoever your audience is going to be? There's been a lot of studies done on this topic, especially recently when there's been these claims that social media has made people's attention span shorter and things like that. Uh, people wanted to see if that was actually true and see if that really impacted the way we try to educate our audiences. So just to give you some background, um, on the resources page that I provided to Robin to share with you all, they actually ha have spent several studies by shared with you too, that talk about how it's always been that way. We've always had extreme overload from long PowerPoint presentations. Anything that is just loaded with information, loaded with talking, gets lost. We all check out at some point, unless we're super, super engaged with that topic or feel more involved. So the study is not saying that social media has made our brain shorter. It's just actually brought to light other ways for us to learn in these compact situations. So what I'm pretty much saying is let's not um, go for these long PowerPoint presentations. We got to keep switching it up. We got to keep it lively. We got to keep it active because that is actually how brains have always engaged. It's not a new phenomenon. Does this mean that if you're given an hour time to present something, you shouldn't take the full hour? No, I mean, we're, we're always trying to get time and attention, but we just need to find different ways to present our topic so that way we don't get burdened down by over information and having people check out on us. So what are we doing instead? Um, all these studies have shown that people learn well through podcasts, mini lectures, and animations. And depending on the topic you're trying to teach about or the content you're trying to get across, one of these might work better than another. And so I'm gonna give you some examples of how uh, I've come to these conclusions that how some other people have come to these conclusions. And the purpose of this is when you're talk when you're listening to a podcast, you're listening to an audible uh, learning opportunity, you essentially have more capacity because you're only hearing something. You're not also seeing something. So you're not being overly stimulated by two different senses. So podcasts can actually be a little bit longer than a lecture. So these mini lectures are also just breaking up content into 10 minute segments. So instead of using 60 minutes to talk about something, break it up into 10 minute segments with something that changes the pace in between. And then animations is essentially taking a lecture where you're gonna put up a PowerPoint slide like this and go slide by slide by slide, but instead turn it into a one screen animation that tells your story in a more engaging way. And I just want to point out that these are still very short. With a podcast, you're given an opportunity to go between 10 minutes and 30 minutes. Um, and I'm going to show you some of the podcasts I've created where when I'm just talking and I'm not interviewing anyone, I keep them under 10 minutes. But if I'm interviewing someone and there's very active dialogue back and forth, I will allow them to go up to 30 minutes, but no more. Same with many lectures. 
usually those are had to be eight to 10 minutes, anything longer than that. And your audience will sign off halfway through and move on with their lives. And they didn't get your full message or intent. Same with animations. We're still looking at a screen. We're still looking at a video. So we want to make sure that those are also kept to this eight to 10 minute segment. And like I said, you can mix and match these to get an hour long worth of content, which is kind of sort of what we're going to do today. But also um, think about how what you're trying to say would fit into either one of these categories to develop this content. So this takes me on to, you need to know your audience. Uh, one of the main issues that we have found is that we're trying to create content for too many reasons to reach too many different groups of people. And we need to actually think about um, who we're trying to make this content for. And there's no real wrong answer. You just need to think about it. So what I want to do is, um, you know, take this poll that I totally forgot to close out last time when Robin told me to. Okay, no, we're gonna do this one. Robin, I messed up already. Um, okay, here we go. So I want to find out like who is your primary audience. You can select as many as you want, but why are you here today? What is your goal of who you want to reach with this? All right, poll information is coming in. People are going heavy for the public. Right behind them is staff engagement. Oh man, this is, you, you guys are quick on the polls. Still coming in. All right, <clears throat> wow, okay, good turnout for the polls. So hopefully you can see the results and this doesn't surprise me, most of you wanna engage the public and that's a great way to really show people what goes into collections care. We're often seen as the sort of elusive, non-existent body of people working quote unquote behind the scenes but what we do is actually very active in supporting everything forward facing and most people don't know we exist. So having public engagement Will, have, will actually increase the awareness of what you do, increase the people who donate to you, increase the awareness of all your stakeholders that the public knows what you do. So engaging the public is vitally important. Um, staff and is also important because we want the staff to know what we do, but we also want to record what we have learned on the job that we need to pass on to other staff members so that they can also learn on the job. Um, so yeah. The results that public is number one is 77%, staff at 48, not surprising. Um, classrooms, I'm assuming this is for your educational programs or um, lecture halls, things like that, that 30%, then stakeholders, and then other. I'm interested, I don't know if you people who wrote other want to put in the chat box what other is. I'm just curious more than anything. Okay, great. So we're going to talk about all these different ways you can engage in all of these different environments because collections care knows no bounds. We will go anywhere and do anything to make sure people understand what it takes to care for our collections. So depending on um, your audience, this is how we're gonna develop our content. So if we're reaching out to the public, we need to think about what do they already know? What do we want them to know? And where is it gonna go from here? Same with internal staff, same with stakeholders, same with funders, but with public, we're actually dealing with people who really don't know anything about us. So it could be overwhelming to put a lot of information out there and hope something sticks, but instead the public is going to be more likely to engage with these animations or micro lectures or podcasts. And I'm gonna go a little bit more into that, but I also wanna talk about branding. A lot of um, videos I see primarily put out on social media by museums is that they always start off with someone giving a long introduction, such as my name is so-and-so, I'm a such and such at this institution. And it usually takes, what well, doesn't seem very long, like 15 or 20 seconds, but that in that amount of time, you've actually lost the audience's attention. All they're seeing is a talking head and they're not actually sure what the content's about. They're ready to move on and scroll and click on to the next thing. So we try to, eliminate this introduction and talking head aspect and immediately go straight into the topic we want them to learn. Because if you're already reducing the amount of time you're projecting your content, you want to get rid of not unnecessary things, but in a video, you can easily just have a caption bar pop up that says the person's name and their occupation, and then have them go further into the topic at hand 
without all this extra wordage. Um, also tone of accounts, you wanna keep it exciting and lively, but you also wanna stay within your professional brand. What is your brand of how you're gonna gauge this content? Um, as a person in private practice, I have content all over the place, YouTube, classrooms, social media, um, lectures, things like that. And I have set a brand standard for myself that on social media, I'm going to be funny. In my um, workshops, I'm going to be, you know, funny, but with a very serious, aggressive level professionalism. While in my classrooms where I teach, you know, upcoming students, other museum professionals, I definitely want this to be a very serious, understandable content with a follow-up assessment of what I want them to learn. So my tone of my accounts actually adjust based on where I'm posting this platform, post, posting to what platform, it's not willy nilly. It's a well thought out brand, but also my branding is in my colors, my fonts and my logos. If the people are on my social media account, I don't need to tell them they're on my social media account. They know where they are, but if it is shared and passed forward, having my color scheme built into every single bit of content I create, having my, my brand font, having my brand logo, insert it into these videos without adding that extra content into talking, people start mentally recognizing your content without even knowing it's you. We've all had those, those specific speakers, social media accounts where we're like, oh, I know who that is. Oh yeah, I love it when they start this off like that. And it's not necessarily you recognize the person's name, but you recognize the brand of, that they put out um, to make it more engaging. So you don't need to have this talking head giving you long introductions. You can engage through tone, and through colors, fonts, and logos branding so that you don't have to keep repeating the same stuff over and over again. Hopefully that makes some sense. So then once we have this sort of branding and we don't need to spend any effort doing long introductions or explaining our institution or things like that, we can then develop the rest of our content. The first question you gotta ask yourself, who are we making this content for? Are we making this for the public? Are we making this for our board? Are we making this for our staff? Who's this content for? And does that impact what platform we use and that we're gonna publish this digital content onto? And then we can get into the script. What do we wanna say? And why do we wanna say it? Are we creating this content because we want someone to learn something very specific and then show that they've learned it through an assessment? Or do we want them to just engage with us and realize we're here? Um, so what is the messaging that you're trying to get out? And I cannot express enough how important it is to script this. A lot of stuff can be done on the fly, but the more you script, the less ums and ah uh and so forth you'll come up with and you'll actually have more engagement because it feels more flowy. That being said, keep it lively and active. Do not read your script. Practice your script by looking up and away from it. You wanna be engaging, lively and informative. And like I said, part of that messaging should follow up with what's the learning objective? What do we want the audience to learn from this? Do we want to actually have them, um, you know, say, you know, it doesn't have to be something that they have to come back and give you a homework assignment. Obviously, we're not expect that from the public, but say, hey, can you instead engage and let us know, is there another thing you would like to see from us? Um, did you enjoy this content? Make sure you go and take care of your stuff at home. Like, you know, get them sort of an action item that is their learning objective so that they know that the learning from you does not end in the square box on their phones, they can actually take it home with them or think about it outside of the context. So have a learning objective. And then um, timing, as much as it sounds weird, if you post to social media um, during you know, prime work hours, like 10 to 12, you're probably not gonna get as much engagement as if you post during lunchtime because that's when people are scrolling through their phones. Or you know, I find a lot of success at the 3 p.m uh mind is melting time with people checking social media so there is a lot of information out there about social media trends of when people are primarily engaging with social media and granted no matter what time you post it you're going to have somebody who's on social media but just make sure the audience you're trying to reach is on social media at that time or else it's going to get pushed down and pushed down and pushed down so when at what time do you want this engagement to occur i definitely uh primarily post at 9 a.m and 3 p.m because that is when my audience is paying attention. And that is something I've learned by looking at my analytics with my social media. But yeah, you might have different, depend, look at your audience and learn about when they engage with social media. And then with your staff and other indoor people, um, interior people, 
they'll engage when you tell them to engage. So that's a little bit easier, but social media for the public, it's a much harder algorithm to kind of figure out. So then you get to make the content. You've scripted it. You've come up with when you're going to post it. You decide on your platform, you decide on your audience, your learning objectives, and then you actually have to physically make it. And this is where people can spend a lot of time or a little bit of time. And I, again, in private practice, don't have a lot of time to dedicate to this because when I'm not working, I'm not, you know, earning any income. So I have to make these videos quickly to further engage people so that eventually maybe that will lead to more connections, more income, more, you know, just buy-in for collections care. So when you're making the content, make it fun and high energy. It doesn't have to be funny, but it should be, still be a fun, worthy time to spend with you. No one wants to spend a boring time with you. So I'm have a fun time with you and high energy just to keep them engaged. Like right now, I'm not showing you anything special, but I am hopefully talking very anim animatedly animated. So that way you all feel as if I'm not just droning to you. And then, you know, one of the things most people are scared of these days, but it's not going anywhere is utilizing um, AI, artificial intelligence. I'm going to show you some ways I use it and how it has made my ability to create content so much easier and so much more engaging. And this is going to go into like, what software are you using to develop this content? A lot of apps um, have stuff built into them to go straight to social media, but I actually make my content outside of the social media apps and instead create it specifically in a software that I then input into my social media. Don't worry, I'm just giving you the background. I'm going to show you a lot of this stuff in real time. And then engage with the audience, give them some activity to follow up with what you want to do. So if you reach out to the public, ask a question, um, create a challenge. And then if they do engage with you, respond to their posts. Don't let them feel like they're talking to thin air. When you're working with an internal audience, such as your staff, stakeholders, funders, board, whoever that might be, still give them a challenge. Say, okay, you've now watched this video on how to um, build a box. Now make me a box. You know, or I've showed you how uh, the acquisitions committee process works. Now show me you understand this by let's practicing through an acquisitions committee review. Whatever you want to do, there has to be some sort of follow-up learning objective engagement that makes people feel like they really got this information and it didn't just go in one ear and out the other. And I want to talk about tools. Um, you're essentially looking at the type of tools I use, but you still need to think about what you need. If where most of your content is being created as a dark place, you need to get some lighting. If And you wanna make sure that the mounting works for wherever you're gonna be creating your content. Um, I had one of the table mounts that screwed onto the edge of the table to stay upright and I could um, articulate it to be upwards looking at me or being downwards looking at what I'm doing with my hands. But what eventually happened is I got a new table where it was now too thick to hold onto that clamp. So then I had to get a tabletop surface one. So you want to think about where you're going to actually be creating this content. So that way you don't, you buy the right gear, make sure you get the right lights, get the right type of arm. You can spend hundreds of dollars on the different types of mount, or there's so many options now, especially after we kind of become more of a virtual world for under $50. There's a lot of uh, good things you can buy. And the other one I use a lot is the one you see on the bottom, which is a magnetic um, mount. And because I spend a lot of time in collection storage spaces with metal cabinets, it's really easy for me to magnetize my phone to this little magnet and the other magnet sticks to the side of a cabinet and it just sits there. Um, it's not very articulating, so it really only does a straight on view, but sometimes that's exactly what I need because, you know, I need the cabinet space for doing the rehousing project or doing the organization. So I save myself space while still getting it recorded by having this magnetic mount that goes onto the side of casework. But otherwise, I just use my phone. I actually have a, when I upgraded my phone, I kept my old phone just to do video content. So that way I can take it off, put it on my computer, edit in my software, and then send it on to social media. Because I always want my phone with me because I got to take a call because nothing's worse than recording something and you get a call in the middle. So it stops recording and throws off your whole, your whole jam. So I do actually have my old iPhone that I use for recording versus the, my current phone that I use for calls and listening to audiobooks while I'm creating content, things like that. So think about what you want to do to create the content and where you're primarily going to be creating it, because that's going to depend on what type of tools you get. But none of these are expensive. 
Um, using an old phone was, uh, I mean, I'm going to say free because I didn't have to pay for it, but also you can use your current phone, which you're already paying for, but you can also get a camera, whatever works for you in your context, but really think about how you're going to mount these tools to create the content, whether it's a little magnetic thing or it's an arm, or do you want one of those big, sturdy face down um, cameras? There's a lot of options out there. You really cannot go wrong. And they really do span from $10 to $200. So just find something that works perfectly for your surface. Don't buy it ad hoc. Know where you're going to be creating this content. Hmm. My, little, my little image has decided not to come up. So the two softwares I'm going to show you today are fairly inexpensive. Um, I have used more expensive software in the past, like Filmora and Wondershare and um, other video editing software, but with the integration of AI and the improvement on creating digital content, I now fairly exclusively use Adobe Express and Canva. So I'm going to show you what I like and what I don't like about them. And it's really almost a preference. They're very similar. But with Adobe Express, I really like the AI image generator. When I just need an image of something and I don't have a good picture of it, I can ask uh, Adobe Express to make that image for me. I'll show you some excellent examples. And it also does have a helpful animation feature where I can animate myself or animate my scripts, things like that. And they also have fun templates. While in Canva, I find it easier to create quick movies or, or reels by using their magic tools. And also it has a good AI text generator, which is better than their um, image generator versus I think it's better than Adobe's text generator, but it also has fun templates. So I jump back and forth between those two softwares, but that's just something I've gotten used to. It was a slow progression. Um, and I'm just going to show you what I like about each of them. Cause I mean, some of you might only have a budget for one. Some of you might have a budget for both. Some of you might already have an Adobe software um, suite. Some of you might already have Canva. So I just want to kind of show you both. There are other softwares out there. I have not engaged with them because I found that these two fit all my needs and are very simple um, to use. So I'm going to stop here with this presentation and take you to go look at some stuff very quickly. So I know you can see my whole computer, that's by design. So well, let me bring up Canva first. So while we're in Canva, I wanna show you very quickly this brand kit. They have a whole section where you can set up your brand. So here's my company brand. I came in and I added my logo. I took all the colors from my kit and put it in here. And I even changed all the fonts to the same font that's in my logo. So that way people start making that mental visual connection between my content and everybody else's. I even have, you know, additional photos I can, as part of my kit. And these are the icons that my little octopus holds to also incorporate those into videos very easily and quickly. So having this brand kit set up really makes it much quicker to build these videos because the brand's already included. The text, like when I use AI to generate videos, it's already gonna include my font, it's already gonna include my images, um, exactly how I want them to go. So I would encourage you for both either in Canva or Adobe Express to set up your brand kit. That really takes out a lot of work of adding all that extra bit of information in. So I'm gonna go back. Um, so yeah, set up your brand kit, start making that recognizable, step one. So now I'm gonna show you um, how I essentially use um, AI to create content for me. So in Canva, they have this thing called the Magic Studio, which I really enjoy. And you can kind of create videos, you can create designs, you can do uh, have it right for you, things like that. It just really, you, you essentially use um, AI to create whatever you want for you. Um, I play with a lot of these features and I do find like their uh, Magic Animate, uh, Resize and Switch to be very helpful. Um, but I also find their ability to create AI images, not so helpful. But let me show you how I create a video. So magic design for video. So I'm gonna try my magic design and it, and it asks me, you know, I tell it I want it to make a reel or whatever. And then I come through and let's just say, I'm gonna click these four images or five images and say, and then give it a command, say, use these images to make an instructional video on how to install an exhibition. And I push generate. And so it's essentially gonna take those images, try to input its own understanding of what's happening in the images, but it is still gonna use my brand kit to come up with the font and the logos. So let's see how it did.
I don't know why it's putting objects on the bed. It's learning. So with, uh, you know, 24 seconds, we had some close to okay content. Obviously you would have to go in and adjust it. AI is not perfect, but if this did this for me in 10 seconds, it saves me a lot of like adding in, adding in, editing, creating short. It even picked out some music for me, which I did not play for you all because it's, it's, I don't know, it's weird. I don't think you could hear it. But yeah, 24 second video created with five seconds of work. And I would do a little bit of adjusting, but essentially I could get this done in about 15 minutes. So that's one way that it works, but it definitely always, I have a program to always add my logo at the end. So people know it's me, but I didn't need any words for this. People could watch this with no sound on and just have new content that they've learned. So this is something really easy for um, public programming. I don't wanna, you know, spend too much time on this, but I did wanna show you some of the content I have created using this information. So if you go back to your front and go to the, go to projects, um, I can have it look at all my videos and I can pull up videos as I, you know, these are videos that I've made in the past. So this is one I made that is list 21 seconds of high energy showing how to make a box. Um, I did not make this to teach anyone how to make a box. I just wanted the world to see that this was, you know, a lot of effort goes into making boxes. It's not just like they magically appear. So that was the content of this video. Not really thought, so there's no instructions. I wasn't trying to make instructions, just trying to teach someone that this is something that exists. And, you know, then I have like these more elaborate videos that I've made where I actually have people um, sort of talking and having conversations. Um, and this was because I was trying to explain to people why this topic was important and nobody was listening to me. But the second I made an animation video that was ridiculously corny, everyone all of a sudden was like, oh man, I finally get this topic. So, you know, I just had a conversation about between museum professionals with just sound in the background and they could read this text. And um, the buy-in was drastically improved from me trying to explain a topic to showing them a one minute video. So huge participation increase. All right, so outside of that, between social media and a few other things, oh, sorry, hold on one sec, trying to show you too much at one time, is this is Adobe Express. This is where I said that I use it for other things, you know, some things over others. And one of the things I like about it is this um, animate from audio, where you can pick your character and, you know, say, oh, I want to be a cloud. And then it actually starts where I can record what I'm saying with this cloud image. And then eventually it will use AI to connect my words to the cloud. I don't know why you'd wanna be a cloud in a cultural heritage video, but it's an option. Um, so also, and I apologize because the alien at the top waiting for my cloud to become something is a little weird. I don't know why, but I do find this extremely helpful to tell something content so I can make, instead of being a cloud, I could be a person. I could be an AI um, cartoon version of myself. I can do whatever I need to make this content more engaging. And it's sort of the same um, usage for when I record or I have text already that I've recorded, language I've already recorded. I can just actually import it and then the cloud will start talking to me. Um, so anyhow, I'm gonna let this sort of sit while I show you something else. It does take a little bit to, to work out, but don't worry, it'll come up, I promise you. So the other thing I wanted to show you was this doesn't have to be overly complex, right? We don't need these videos to be overly um, instructional. You can actually do stuff with no words. So this is a video from the um, National Postal Museum that they created on an instructional for staff of how to do backing and wrapping. And as you can see, it's, um, um, oh my gosh, what's it called? Yep. Yeah time animation where they just took photos. They had a camera stand that went over where they were working and took an, it was set to take an image every few seconds. They had that automated with the camera. So they weren't taking the pictures themselves. And they essentially show you exactly how to do backing and wrapping with no words, just music, but you're still getting an instructional video of the entire content in two minutes. So we're staying within that, you know, videos need to be under between eight and 10 minutes. They're well under, which is way more successful. So that's one example. 
And this was for internal staff as well as it is on their public YouTube thing, but this was how they were starting to teach people to really engage with this process and what goes into it and why we just can't quickly back and wrap something. It does take a little bit of an effort. So the other video I wanted to show you guys was one that um, I made with my colleague Dana for the ARCS virtual um, conference we had last year. One of the questions we asked ourselves was, who's our audience? It's a bunch of registrars and collections manager. What do we want them to learn? We want them to learn to build an emergency kit. However, that information is out there. We don't need another lecture or another um, informational handout on how to build an emergency kit. They're so easy to find on the internet. Dana and I have actually made them before. So our question this time was like, what can we do to make it different? And we wanted to add a sustainability element, but then we also wanted to um, make it more engaging. So we asked ourselves, what do I really want? What do I really wish I could get across to everyone? And the answer essentially was, we want to take them shopping with us. We want them to actually come shopping with us so that they can see how we do things. So we start off with a background lecture, you know, standard wise, but at exactly, you know, five minutes and well, six minutes, we change speeds because remember I said, you want to change speeds every 10 minutes. We had 20 minutes, but we want to stick to this eight minute, 10 minute rule. So we actually take you shopping with us. So we went from this lecture slide by slide mentality to actually physically taking you in the stores with us and recording it. Um, Dana used put, placed her phone, <laughs> adhered her phone somehow to the cart where the, where the kid sits. And that's how she recorded it and got this content. And we added in these features like to pause and learn, and as well as, you know, walking with us down the aisles, but at a high rate of speed. And then, you know, we continue to change it. We eventually get to the point where we take you secondhand shopping to get your supplies. And we just use still photos moving rapidly to go from one to the other. So in this 17 minute video, we actually changed pace three times. And that was to help further engage um, the people viewing it. So this was well thought out and we actually mapped this out, wrote a script, developed content to make it really clear and to not lose focus by changing our content every five to eight minutes. So just to give you an example, let me see, how did our, um, how did our cloud do? Yeah. So then you can ask it to generate your preview. So now it's doing the lip sync. Isn't this fun watching the bar scroll by? Usually it's quicker. I think I have too much stuff running on my computer for fun and games. But just to show you another example, while this is still thinking, is one of the most successful um, TikTok educational accounts is um, Oklahoma Wildlife. And one of the reasons we um, I wanted to share this one with you is because they decided that their brand is going to be, they're always wearing something with their logos in it, but also to be quirky and fun to really engage people in the education of wildlife. So just to show you this one, and it, cause it's only a few seconds long. We're girls, we like to work in the warehouse. For girls, when armadillos get Rejected pregnant, one it. egg is fertilized, it waits for four months to gestate. And then after that, it has four identical quadruplets. So we're girls, we're gonna forget to eat all day and we're gonna complain that we're hungry. Imagine every time you get pregnant, you have like four kids, like you know that it's just, going to happen biologically you we're girls we're pollinators an armadillo can actually manage up to 12 burrows we're girls we're gonna be iron deficient they've been slowly expanding the range since the 1800s we're girls we're gonna text you back in three business days lily actually thought they were reptiles before we're girls we're gonna do eye placements and like i said they also have like four toes in the front and five toes on the back please buy this we're girls we so as you can see, like, it's just fun and engaging, but you learned a lot about armadillos, which I don't know. Yeah, okay, that's what happens. Um, so, you know, just to show you my Instagram account of how this works, my number one engaged video with over, with almost 2000 views and most likes is this video. That is literally it. Everyone liked it because I was showing them not how to do something, but what can be done and like sort of inspirational, I guess. I don't know, it wasn't that inspirational, but for some reason it was it was uh, viewed over 2000 times. And my most liked image 
and engage with image is this one. Just showing how to use a uh, pipe insulation when you have no budget. So, you know, lots of comments. Well, for me, I'm not an influencer, as I said, but you know, you never know what's going to appeal to people. But if you know your audience, you can generate content that actually works for them. So just kind of wanted to show you how there's just so many different ways to do it. Um, this video also got that I made also has a lot of content and generation, but had less views than the other one. But just wanted to show you that I'm just showing the simple technique that doesn't even need explanation. You can see I'm actually just adding Tyvek to foam, but I'm explaining why I'm doing it. And it got so much feedback of like, oh, that's a great idea. I'm going to save this. It got shared to conservation tips. It went a little bit more forward. And I, there's no words. It's literally just what you see on the screen with some, you know, I, put, I think I put in some rap music to make it sound really corny, but that's just my brand. My brand is to be corny on social media. Um, and then I just want to dive quickly, I don't need, into more uses for AI. So remember, AI is making our cloud, which is just not cooperating. But if you have Adobe Express, play with a bunch of your fun, um, you know, little animations. I have a few that I've played with, um, but I want to show you a few other things I created instead of waiting for this thing to, lo to load up. I, I, I told Robin this was more scary because I was having to make sure all my technology worked for you all. So of course it is not. Um, but one of the other things I said I liked about Adobe Express is that the tech, the AI generative image producer is actually really helpful because sometimes to make my um, lectures more engaging, I just need a picture of something and it's not always one that I have readily available. So I can tell AI um, image of a woman wearing sweater and jeans in a museum holding an ancient vase with nitrile gloves. I learned to actually tell it to give me nitrile gloves because it always gives me white gloves and I'm not perpetuating a stereotype in my uh, social media. So definitely want to make sure um, I do this correctly. And it is definitely being uncooperative today. Let me try a refresh and see what happens. I think I've just tired it out. My computer is exhausted from having all these softwares open. All right, so let's try this again. All right, generative AI. Woman wearing jeans and sweater in museum while holding, helps if you spell right, ancient vase while wearing nitrile gloves. As I said, it always wants to give you white gloves. Even AI does not understand our glove obsession. And then as it's generating the stuff, you'll see over here on the left side, it says content type. And you can select and say that you want it to be arty or you want it to be more normal. And, um, you know, it more normal is just, you know, normal. So it looks like a real human. Granted, sometimes you have to be very careful because AI hey, is not perfect. So you start seeing some warped features. But essentially, it gave me what I asked for. It created a person who looks like they're working in a museum wearing nitrile gloves, holding an ancient artifact. All right, so this is an example of a bad one. Also, we don't want to use that showing not using two hands, but also you can see right in the middle here, there's a break in her glove. So AI is not perfect. So what have I said instead? I want this to be more like artwork, more cartoony, hit generate again. And it will essentially try to give me that same image based on that same prompt, but a more cartoonish fashion, which again, is just for, you know, to make it different types of engaging. So instead we have this one. Um, and this, oh, see, look at the hand. You don't, you gotta be careful with AI, but some are more appropriate than others. So you just kind of have to go through and it gets easier and easier to write the prompts, but also um, just, you know, it's fun to kind of see what comes up with your prompts. It's, you get some weird stuff sometimes, especially in the museum world. Also, if you just put in a collections manager for a museum or a registrar, they think we all wear suits. So be prepared for that. But yeah, I can even tell it to make the gloves purple. I can give it other commands. But, you know, just to show you that this has actually been really helpful of me filling in some gaps where there's not an image of something I'm trying to show. And for the last bit, I wanted to show you all what I developed for the classroom. Um, I know we're right at time when I wanted to stop to open to questions, but this should be fairly quick. So I actually teach um, collections management at George Washington University. And so this is how kind of how I had to think very differently about the content I generated. 
And this was much more thought out because of having to go like a whole semester, a whole program, a whole learning objective. And so the first thing I did was think about all the topics I want to cover and then write out specifically what I wanted the students to learn. And based on that learning opportunity, I had to come up with ways I was going to assess that they understood what I was teaching them. And that understanding could come through readings or what I was telling them directly. And then I had to ask myself, is the best way to tell them the story about law and ethics and collections management through video, through a podcast, through an animation? And throughout the course, I, I alternated between all those. So sometimes you see an animation, sometimes you just see a podcast, sometimes you'll see um, a lecture or mini lecture. Um, I really kind of um, oscillated back and forth because based on that content, I changed well, based on the learning objective, I changed my content. And um, to kind of show you what some of this ended up looking like with the course, I have a podcast here. This podcast is only four minutes and 50 seconds. And while it does just play audibly, if I push play, which I'm sure you guys don't want to spend four minutes listening to me talk about law and ethics, I do also have downloadable transcripts because it must be ADA compliant. Even the stuff we put on social media, make sure captions can be turned on, make sure we're actually reaching a full audience and not just those without any sort of disability. Um, one of the other, so then I did that, but then also used Adobe Express to generate some um, animations. And these are animations that have also come in very handy for when working with um, stakeholders and the board say like, you know, I want them I want them to understand, you know, how acquisitions methods work in this museum. So you can see here on the left is like an um, AI generated image that we asked AI to make. But then otherwise, I'm just talking over a Friedman animation that explaining the workflow of this particular museum, as well as the closed captioning is um, at the bottom. So you can see it highlights, accents, moves on. Um, and just in general is a much more helpful tool than me trying to use a projection slides or trying to explain it verbally. And I did have to come to terms with myself that I can't teach anybody anything in a very little amount of time. I have to rely on their already base knowledge, but other aspects of our um, training. So with social media, if you're doing, um, you want people to learn more and more about a topic, just do little increments at a time and building blocks up. Or if you're in a classroom or for staff, do the same thing. Say, let's practice object handling before we start going into box building, before we go into soft packing, before we go into these exhibition techniques. Make it progressive, but keep it short. So just kind of wanted to show you all those different examples because I think that's the best way to learn. I don't know your institutions personally. I don't know, um, you know what your struggles are, but what I do want to make sure happens is that you see a lot of different examples and start thinking about the best way to uh, generate your content. So that was an incredibly quick throw around of all the different ways to work. Um, Whenever I was learning stuff on YouTube and Adobe Express, I looked up a lot of YouTube tutorials. So rely on social media to help you with your social media, rely on other people's content to help you with your content. Um, but I'm also happy to um, answer any questions, Robin, if anything came up. Yes, it sure did. Thank you so much. And going back to kind of your, your conversation with the stakeholders um, and who you're making this media for, when you had asked your poll question earlier today, some of the others that people had put in were things like volunteers, uh, staff and volunteers at small and local historical societies, and then marketed populations to the public. So it makes sense, you know what I mean, that you're really going to have to think about who those stakeholders are before you start making your videos. Because I even know, you know, we've talked about this offline of how like the way my kids learn so different than the way I learned and even thinking like I did the GW course way back in like 05 and everything we got was on CDs and <laughs> we popped it into our computer and just watch lectures which is what we had back then right like that was like pretty interact like wow look we're, we're seeing recorded Maria Delangelo you know what I mean talking about all these fabulous things so it's um it's it's interesting to kind of see just how the learning styles and the media types have all updated for sure yeah and I'll definitely just add that like it's an opportunity. It's not like we're having to adjust to how people learn now because it's not the way we used to do it. It's totally. more of like, we just have more opportunities to reach people in so many different ways, but just transferring something from one content platform to another content platform doesn't often work. So you have to really, yeah, based on your audience, based on the platform, 
based on what you're trying to teach them, really hunker down to a message. And yeah, so yeah, it's an opportunity, not us fully adjusting. There you go. <laughs> All right. So one of the first questions that came in were um, the photos used in the AI example, were they your own or were they, were, the, were they program found for you online? Now I know that like a Canva, which is what I have more experience with, they have a whole like stock footage area that they tend to use out of, but what's been your experience with it? So I tend to use a lot of my own photos, um, but because, I mean, the ones I showed you when I was making that video, those were my photos that I took of an exhibition install. Um, but I have used some several stock videos and or images and things like that on the Canva presentation. And again, you just tell it what you want and it will give you suggestions. And sometimes it takes a little bit of hunting to find exactly the pre-developed stock image that tells your story, which is why I've been going to Adobe Express, getting more of a perfect image and then bringing it over to Canva because I can download it from Adobe Express, import it into Canva. Um, and that's the same with if my cloud would have talked you know, you could have seen me as a cloud talking to you and it reads the tone of my voice to make the cloud adjust or I shouldn't say cloud, any animation you want, but I was going to be a cloud, you know, adjust to um, your facial expressions and you can even train it to shrug or lift its arms up or wave to you whenever you want. And then that gets downloaded and put into Canva to tell more of a story. So that's why I go back and forth because I don't feel like images generated by Canva through AI are helpful, but their pre-stocked images are helpful if that helps. No, totally. And I think that's a good point too, is that like you, you, can, you can use the two programs together. There's nothing saying that you have to just use one and stick the lane with that one. Like if you have the ability to get into the both, you might as well use both if you can. Right. Um, someone says, have you worked, have you worked, you mentioned this, have you worked with the accessibility features for these types of software? Um, just, you, you talked about the transcript option, which is great. What else has been your experience with the accessibility parts? Yeah, so you can, um, Adobe has a lot of great features to run anything you write up, any of your programs through an eight, for, through an accessibility filter. So um, I can even tell Adobe to uh, generate a transcript based off of a video or to make sure it is um, visually appealing enough for people who have to hear an, about an image through alt text or things like that. So um, the, both, both of those softwares do have those features to generate closed captioning, or to uh, review your content for ADA accessibility. It's just an extra feature in there that if you click on the menu, it's like accessibility. Um, so it's really, they make it really easy to find because they are realizing people are using this for a very broader reach content. Um, I do find that the closed captioning one is a little off, but I also have a, apparently a strange accent based on the rest of the world. Um, and so it, it does misinterpret some words I say. And uh, you know, just an example is when I say, mitigation, like I'm mitigating a response, I tend to say mitigation with like a D sound. And so of course I get a weird word that pops up through closed captioning. So still don't rely on it heavily, do a little bit of editing to make sure your full message is getting across. Well, I mean, and that's true for all these things, right? Is it's like you even showed with the, with the, uh, the AI generation, which someone noted in the chat, like some of the fingers were awesome. <laughs> like some of the fingers that were showing up on those things were like, like <laughs> slender man fingers, which is, you know what I mean? Like totally. Yeah. And but um, whenever you produce any of these things via AI, via any of these, like the captioning services, like now C2C Care uses a live captioner who's working diligently away right now. It's very much appreciated. That is going to give you slightly different results than uh, with just letting the AI system using the captioning. So there's still like that human element evolved, I think, in all of these that you can't just like accept what the computer gives you and move on with your life. You always have to kind of review it and be like, yeah, no, this is what I was talking about. It's it's just another tool. It's not a solution. It's a tool to a much bigger solution that has made life faster, thankfully. Yeah, exactly. Um, someone's asking, do you know of any open source software that has similar AI functionality? Do you know of any, or I would encourage people in the chat to add any, if they've heard of any that does the same thing. Yeah. So, um, yes. So, um, there's several different ones and I, and I honestly have just been playing with a bunch of do, uh, free ones just to kind of see what I would recommend, but Canva has a free, um, base software that does still allow AI use, just not as um, uh, deep as the one you see, but they still have the magic studio. They still have some AI, accessibility AI features, you know, things that really do need to be had, but I think it doesn't have like, um, there's one or two things it doesn't have when you have to pay for the premium one, but Canva does start out free. 
So you can see if that works for you before you upgrade. Um, and Adobe Express is like, you can buy Adobe Express separately from the rest of the Adobe package. But I have tried um, some of these free ones and they do work okay, like uh, Harpa and a few others that you get for free, but they just have a limited amount that you're allowed to use before you're out of free credits and you have to wait another month. So most of them have about the same results, but I can't say specific software because I'm still playing with them, I guess I would say. But just play with the free one and see what gives you what you need. Um, they're free, right? So no harm, no foul. I would also add, and I'm sure most of us know this, but um, if any of these softwares you look at and you happen to work for a nonprofit, always go for nonprofit pricing because a lot of these places will give you uh, rebates or chunks off. Canva does, I know for a fact, gives you gives you nonprofit pricing. And I'm sure Adobe has nonprofit, you know, off its websites like TechSoup or things like that. Like it's always good to pursue those. So sure folks know that. And I know as me as an independent person, I have my own Canva that I have to pay out of pocket for every month. But um, for other groups I work with, I, we can get the nonprofit pricing. So just heads up a little tip for people. Yeah. I'd also say well. make friends because they like Canva, my premium subscription allows up to like six people or 10 people to use it. And it's just me. So I do share it with other people and, you know, who need it, things like that. And yeah, it's fine. Yeah, I, that's hard. Friends with other to, institutions like you. <laughs> well, that's that's harping back to my undergrad days when I think everyone had that one copy of Microsoft Works and everyone shared it <laughs> like across campus, pretty much. So that dates me with the use of that. Um, any tips or recommendations on how to find and use suitable background music for your videos? There is a lot of free music on YouTube. I know that. Do you have anything that you recommend, generally speaking, for music? Um, honestly, I just use what's in stock on any of those softwares. Canva has an excellent free, um, no sound or audio, uh, once and they separated by mood. So you can kind of pick one. Um, I might be the worst person to ask this question. Cause my favorite thing to do in my social media is to pick the music. That's the most contradictory to what you see. So like, as I said, you know, lining foam with Tyvek and I used a rap song because I was just like, yes. That was my mood when I was making this. I felt very powerful, you know? So um, yeah, they have plenty to, to share with that. So you don't really need to go to outside stuff, but Robin's right. YouTube has lots of um, open access, free music um, options. And um, yeah, so does, like I've gotten stuff off of Spotify. I've gotten stuff off of um, Apple Music from their free library. Like it's just, it's all over. But because I don't really, music is not part of my, huge brand it's more of like telling like just something so it's not silent I don't spend a lot of time on hunting for music I just look for something already in the archive in one of these softwares yeah that's pretty much been my experience as well um I'll also add that someone say someone in the chat says pixabay is good for free music um and then someone else recommend for ai text generation google gemini can be effective as mm -hmm. well so there's a couple other programs out there that people can look for. Um, also says in public library and academic museums um, might also have some, some sources that you guys can access. So I would encourage that as well. Yeah, um, I will oh, say, sorry, Robin, I will say like one of the other things I used AI for that was super helpful was when I was recording those podcasts, I did accidentally say, um, you know, more times than I wanted to. So I told AI to review my podcast and delete, um, out of the editing software. So instead of going little by little and just clipping, clipping, mending, AI did it for me. And it took like 10 seconds instead of my usual, like four hours of cutting out too many ums. Cause I record a lot of podcasts uh, for that course. And it was made it so much more feasible, but I had, a, it made up for the learning curve as I was trying to learn how to do it. But I bet you so re-listened to it, right? You cut out all the ums, but I bet you, you redid it. And you're like, I'm just going to listen to it again, just to make sure it caught all those, <laughs> like just oh, to be yeah. on the same side. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Because I probably cut out something else I said because apparently my very weird accent. Um, so there, someone has a question kind of, I wanted to open up as a bigger question. It's just, there's a lot of ethical stuff about AI, right? Like people are really questioning the use of it. Um, what, are, what are your kind of thoughts of it? Do you feel like, I know there's been a lot of people just kind of questioning it, saying, is it safe? I I personally feel like this is the same conversation we had about Wikipedia like a decade ago is what I feel like, because I'm just like, this is what we all hated Wikipedia a lot. Now, not that Wikipedia is perfect, but you know, a lot of people use it for a lot of things. So just kind of ethically, what are your thoughts about using all these AI generators and kind of the usage of them in your production? I mean, I think we should, whenever I use AI to make art, turn a photo I've taken into art, 
and things like that and make sure it's my photo. I would never use somebody else's image or things like that to generate an AI thing. But if you do use AI, cite it. Both Chicago Style and MLA have already determined the best ways to cite when you use AI in, um, in a publication. So please, I think the most ethical thing you can do is cite that you used AI and people don't think that this is your, your image and don't use someone else's image to generate an AI to make it fair use or uh, you know to get around copyright. So we ethically are required to you know, be ethical all the time in collections, but yeah, it's just cite it and don't you steal someone's stuff. It's, it's the same rules all the time, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, well, it's 2 p.m. Eastern. So um, I'm gonna close out today's program. Becca, thank you so much. Like this is really, I, I don't, we've kind of, again, spoke offline about how I don't like, we don't, neither of us think this is really going away. <laughs> so it's kind of like, what's the best way we can utilize it and just utilize it properly within our fields. And I think you brought up some really good points and some really good applicable ways that our community can use this software and programming uh, for collections advocacy. So do yeah. you have any final thoughts? No, just reach out to me if you have any questions. Again, I'm not an, an expert on any of these softwares. I've learned a lot through YouTube, but if you like are really struggling to come up with learning objectives, I've done it so much. I'm happy to kind of give you the form I have and um, you know so forth, but good luck everyone. I look forward to all your social medias and all your learning lectures. And if you present at a future conference, I want to be entertained. Yes. So <laughs> thank you all. Exactly. Well, thank you again to FAIC and IMLS for always supporting this program. Um, I did put in the chat earlier links to the resource page we had talked about and then also to the survey for this program. Please take the survey. Uh, we do use, use those results to kind of form future programming for C2C care. So you'll also receive a follow-up email since you registered for the live program with a link to that survey. So I encourage you to take that as well. Um, and finally, uh, register for our upcoming programs. We have ones in April, May, and June. So keep an eye on our website. Hope everyone has a great early spring and we will see you all on April 25th. Thanks again, Becca, and we'll see you guys soon. Thanks everyone.